All right, let's pray together. Lord, we love you, and you are you're our greatest gift. And um, I just love even just being able to sing that. We're not, we're not here for the blessing that you might give. We're here for you. You are our great love, our greatest treasure. So, Lord, you have our hearts this morning. Would you, would you speak and impart life-giving truth to us? And so, um, Lord, for every person, there's, we're just probably a lot of us in different places, maybe in our walk with you, and maybe some uh, that, that aren't walking with you at all this morning, but we're here. So would you, would you speak to us, Lord? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are going to uh, read Malachi chapter 2, and uh, so you can follow along on the screen or open your Bible there or your app or whatever. And so Malachi 2, beginning at verse 1. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and in uprightness. And he turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned away, or turned aside from the way. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. So another light and fun text from Malachi, a stinging rebuke to the priests now in particular, the priests who did not honor God and they ditched the scripture and taught other things which caused people to stumble and to be confused. And God says through Malachi, I'm going to curse your blessings because of that. It's kind of the, the opposite of the Balaam effect. Balaam went to curse God's people and instead a blessing came out. Now the bless, these blessings are going to be cursed. It's amazing how that, that works, that even our blessings can, can present problems. Our riches can be impoverished. You think of the lottery winners a few years after they win the lottery. Well, not only will God curse their blessings, the text says, but he's going to give them a facial, a dung facial. It's the latest rage. They're all doing it. 
Now, what's going on here is God is saying, listen, there's part of the sacrificial animal that has to be taken outside of the tabernacle area, outside of the camp, and it's burned out there. The intestines and the dung and all of that is burned outside. Listen, we're going to spread this on your face. You're going to be taken outside of it. You don't belong here. You're not honoring my name. They were just going through the motions, dead religion. They were oblivious to God's love oblivious to his greatness, and as a result, they were corrupt. They didn't care about the ministry. They didn't care about God's glory. It was just a dead religion. In New Testament terms, 2 Timothy 3, 5, they had the appearance of godliness, but denied the power. So last week, we focused on two massive reasons why we should want to honor and live for Jesus this great king, that it really makes no sense to do anything less than surrender our lives to him and bend our life around him and making his name great in all the earth. The two reasons were his love and his greatness. God's love, when embraced, when understood, when felt and experienced, is the most powerful motivating factor. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, his love compels me. It, it moves me. It, it shoves me out the door and into the world where people need Christ. And the second reason that we ought to live for the Lord is his greatness. <laughs> he tells Israel in the last chapter, he says, I'm a great king. Imagine God having to say that. Because they didn't get it. They didn't get it. But the challenge for us on this side of the cross is that we can't see him with our physical eyes. We can't see this great king. And so faith has to open up this realm of God's greatness and his love. Faith has to give us eyes, spiritual eyes, to see what our physical eyes cannot. And I think we can amen Peter, 1 Peter 1.8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. And the outcome uh, of your faith is the salvation of your souls. So it's really, really crucial that we continually embrace God's love for us and gaze upon his glory, his greatness, because that's what will be fuel in our tank that will take us down the road as far as our road leads. Or to, to further our metaphor from last week, that'll, that'll be authorized fire in our hearts that will burn and will enable us to run the race with endurance. Well, this morning, I just have two, uh, one big idea. I was going to do two, but we didn't make it first service, so I'm just going to submit to that this morning. We're going to got one big idea to, to plow on with you this morning, and that big idea is this. Grace is our teacher. Now, I know that might sound, what, what does that have to do with this big rebuke to the priests? Well, l l just bear with me. I'm going to read Titus 2.11 to you. Listen to this. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly in this present age. So did you hear that? Grace trains us, teaches us, instructs us how to live. Let me just speak for a moment to those of you who have come outside or you've come out of religious systems that were very legalistic. So 
you know, the places where your salvation was very much linked to what you did for that system and in that system, how much you gave and how much you served and how moral of a person you were, how short your hair, how modest your dress or how high you jumped in, in the Pentecostal legalistic circles, you know, that's a big deal is you've got to put out in the service and, and you get wild and that shows that the presence of God is there and that you're really a spiritual person and so on. And so, and you felt like you do all this stuff, you give, you serve, you, and, and it's never enough. You're, you're on a, just a spinning wheel. And the message was always, it's what you do isn't enough. So when you hear a rebukey, corrective text <laughs> or book in this case, it can hit your ears like, great, great, no matter what I do, it's not enough. It's just not enough. I, I, I just, you know, I, I do what I can and, and I just come to church and they tell me it's not enough, I gotta do more. So, so you, hear, you hear something corrective or rebukey or, you know, get it in gear, Christian kind of thing, and it goes through the filter of your baggage, of your past, and then Satan, you know, kind of grabs onto that and, and, and translates it into, into condemnation for you and discouragement. So... Rebuke and exhortation and correction is never, never for the purpose of weighing us down. It's, it's just the opposite. It's for freeing us up and getting us going. So, so for that to happen, we've got to understand and embrace grace. Grace has to be understood and embraced so that when, when we can get a word spoken to us, a text that we read or whatever, that we're going to respond in the right way. So I want to dig down on this idea with you this morning. So let's do that. So here's the question. We've got to kind of break it down to the essentials here. How can fallen, sinful people like us be right in the sight of a holy, righteous God? How can we be made right with him? Our natural tendency, the natural tendency of humans is to is to think that, well, if I just be good, if I grab onto the moral law and try and keep that law as best I can, that's how I will be made right in the sight of God, by, by grabbing the moral law, the code, and trying to live that way. But the Bible says over and over again, the moral law was never meant to make people, as a matter of fact, it can't make people righteous. There's no power in it to do that. In fact, it was given to reveal the fact that we are sinful. So far from giving us right standing before God, it reveals that we're not right with God. So how is it possible for sinful people to be saved from what they deserve? How can a righteous God save wicked people without compromising his righteous, holy character. Well, there's a theological word in the Bible for this, for how this happens. It's called justification. What is that? Justification is a legal term. It means to render or declare righteous. So the Bible de definition, the act of God declaring a sinner righteous in his sight. Now that might not sound hard, you know, you're going, well, that's God, so God can, like, do whatever he wants. He's God, he's all-powerful, but it's trickier than you think, because there's an inherent moral dilemma for God. Proverbs 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. <laughs> Do you see the conundrum? If we're wicked, if we're sinful as the Bible reveals, and God has to justify us, well then, God's violating a principle of his word, potentially. Justifying the wicked is abominable to him. It's abominable to us. 
I was reading this week, this guy, Sean Corbali, was sentenced to 25 years in prison for brutally beating and raping uh, a gal and the victim, the gal in an interview. She said, he threw me out of the car naked. I had to run, knock on a stranger's door for help. And so this guy got 25 years in prison, but because of some sort of error in the way that he was processed, that was immediately sliced in half to 12 and a half years. And then, uh, through good behavior, though he didn't have good behavior, it turns out, in prison, uh, he had a bunch of check marks against him, they still let him out after five years, after which he went out and he raped two more women and beat them brutally. So let me ask you something. How do you think those gals feel about this guy being justified by the courts and set free, or their parents? I think they would say that's an abomination. Justifying the wicked is an abomination. And yet that's exactly what God has to do if we're to be saved. So how? How can God righteously dec declare wicked people righteous? <laughs> the good news is that God is able to provide righteousness a righteousness that's apart from ourself, that comes from outside of us, and he gives it to us through the vehicle of faith. And the reason, the reason God is able to righteously provide righteousness to wicked people is because of another theological word, propitiation. Propitiation means appeasing the wrath of an angry God. That's what it means. And so how did God appease his wrath against all sin and wickedness of mankind? He did it by pouring out his wrath, justice against wickedness on one person. He chose one person to pour out all his wrath on. That person was Jesus Christ, the God-man. And that man, Jesus, was innocent sinless. But somehow, there upon the cross, the sinless Son of God took on himself all the sins of the world, the rapes that this guy committed, the foul things we have done, all of it from all people over all time were placed on Jesus. All we like sheep have gone astray, every one of us to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So now when a person turns from their efforts, from their religiosity, from their self-righteousness, and comes as a guilty sinner to Jesus, their sins are washed away, and they are righteously declared righteous by God. Okay, so God didn't, didn't you know, cut a corner here. Or he didn't, like, you know, make a back door to sneak us in. No, he satisfied Justice completely, Jesus Christ completely satisfied the righteous requirements of the law. And so people like us, putting our faith in Christ results in us being justified, made right in the sight of God. Now to sum all that, it's a word called grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works at all, lest any of us should boast. So this is something that we ought to be fired up about. Can you say amen to that? Yes. So now, let's ask the question, because we're in the Old Testament. What about the Old Testament people? I mean, God's coming down hard on these priests. What's going on here? So what about people in the Old Testament? Abraham was the, the, the single, still is, the single biggest religious hero in Jewish thought. And generally, the Jewish teachers of Paul's day, they believed that Abraham was justified by his righteous life, by keeping the law. And, and they said, in, this is from an ancient writing, we find that Abraham, our father, had performed the whole law before it was given. Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord. So these are rabbis back in the early centuries saying, Abraham, 
He kept the law before there was the law. He was perfect in all his ways. So he was justified before God by his righteous life. But what does the Bible say? Romans 4, verse 1, listen to this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So that's, that's quoting, Paul is quoting Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord, it says, Genesis 15 says, and it was counted to him as righteousness. The word counted, it's an accounting term. It, it means to make a deposit in, a, in an account. So God put, in, in Abraham's account, God put righteousness. God's righteousness was put in that account. So, so Abraham possessed righteousness the same way that a person would possess money placed in his bank account. It belonged to him. How did it get in there? Did Abraham earn it? Was it a wage that was paid to him? No, he got it by believing. Paul makes this point really clear. I'm just going a little further here in Romans 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So how do I get righteousness deposited in my account so that it's mine? I can't work for it because I don't, well, number one, I don't have what it takes. I am not by nature godly. I am by nature sinful. And so, and you, you may say, well, speak for yourself, Adonis. I actually, I got my life together. See, well, even you say in that you're breaking commandments, like, so you need to be justified too. So we get righteousness deposited to our account when we turn from our works, turn from our self-righteousness, turn from all that stuff and come as spiritually poor people to the Lord who then justifies, not godly people. God doesn't justify godly people, not religious people, not moral people. God justifies ungodly people. That's what Paul said. He justifies the ungodly. So if you're unwilling to admit ungodliness, well, then you're out of luck. Because it's only ungodly people that the Lord saves and justifies and deposits righteousness to their account. Now please note, Paul does not say that Abraham was made righteous in all of his doings, but he was counted by God as righteous. So our justification is not God making us perfectly righteous, but it's counting us as perfectly righteous, if that makes sense. There's a big difference. Remember, justification is, is the declaration of a per person as righteous in the sight of God, which happens in a moment. Sanctification is the process by which we practically become righteous in our attitudes and our actions and our words and our deeds and so on over time. After we are counted righteous, God begins making us truly righteous. Christ-likeness begins to happen. So Paul calls on David, the life of David, to illustrate this a little further. And you're going, okay, where are we going with this? Listen again, we're building the case for grace here this morning, okay? So listen to this. Now just as David, this is Romans 4, 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, and David says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So, so David, you remember, committed the really ungodly sins of adultery and murder. I mean, he sinned with his best friend's granddaughter. I mean, he did some bad stuff. 
And after aching in his bones and feeling dry in his spirit and being pressed by the heavy hand of God for a year, better part of a year, and then finally confronted by Nathan, David decided to confess his sin to God. And it says in Psalm 32, 5, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So after year, a year of covering up and justifying himself, David was relieved of the guilt of his sins in the moment that he confessed. This is so radical. The Hebrew word for you forgave, it implies immediacy. So, so it wasn't like, you know, David came to God, I'm sorry, God, and then God says, hey, you're on probation for six months and we'll see how it goes, dude. I want to see if you're, you know, and then I'll maybe remove the thing off your record then after you've shown me something. No. It's immediate. That's great news. And I love it. It was so, such great news to David. <laughs> he says, oh, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Oh, how happy we could say. That's what blessed me. Oh, how happy. You know, David, David, he doesn't say, oh, how happy is the, is the man who has power. David had power. He was the king. He didn't say, oh, how happy is the man who has wealth. And David had all kind of wealth. Happy is the man who has talent. David was a talented dude. He was an athletic guy, a warrior, a musician, a songwriter. He didn't say happy is a man who has fame. He was the most famous guy in the world at that time. He says, oh, how happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. Oh, how happy are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. You know, he uses two different words there, which is interesting. Is he just being redundant? I don't think so. The word forgiven there literally means to send away. The word covered means sprinkled. And so I think David is alluding to something that happened on one day every year, the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, two goats were brought before the high priest on that day. And upon one of the goats, the sins of the people were, um, were put on the goat. And it became known as the scapegoat. And the sins of the nation were put on this goat. And then that goat was sent off into the wilderness. And the second goat didn't go so well for this goat. It gets, got his throat slit and the blood of this goat would be sprinkled upon the mercy seat, the cover of the ark. Uh, on, you know, in the ark was the law. And so the, the blood was sprinkled on the seat. Now, so there's a, there's a beautiful picture that's painted here for us. Even as the, the scapegoat was sent out of sight and into the wilderness, it says in Psalm 103, so our sin is sent away as far as the east is from the west. Isn't that awesome? I, I've just been dwelling on this this week. And, you know, that, that imagery. If, if we were to take off and go north, just to say we, we just did a lighthouse church field trip and we decided to just go north together, we'd get about 4,000-ish miles and, and, and then we'd be going south. Though we didn't change direction, essentially, going in a straight line. Why? Because as soon as you hit the North Pole, the next step you take, you're going south, right? But if, if we go east and we head over towards Pocatello and we head into Utah and across the Midwestern states and the Eastern seaboard, we cross the Atlantic Ocean, we get into Europe, we go across Russia and we go across now the, the Pacific Ocean and so on. Now we're back and we're in California somewhere and then we're back here and we're still going east. We never stop going east. So how far is the east from the west? Infinitely far. Infinite. That's how far your sin is removed. And not only is our sin out of God's sight, it's, it's out of his mind. <laughs> 
Jeremiah 31, 34, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. So remember the second goat whose blood sprinkled on the mercy seat that day, covered you know, the, the law which was inside of the Ark of the Covenant. So to the blood of Jesus blots out the, the memory essentially in God's mind of the sin that's been committed. So, so, so whether you, you know, are a rapist or we're into pornography or adultery or gossip or lying or cheating on your taxes, murder, whatever, it's gone out of God's mind. It's blotted out. I'm glad. (laughs) Because I tell you what, my sins still haunt me some. Sometimes I get a rear view mirror just spiritually stuck right there. You know, all of us have looked up on a clear night into the starry sky and we don't probably think about this a lot but what we're seeing is is light that has traveled a long way for a long time so in in a sense we're kind of looking into the past and and it's the the reverse is true If, if we were on that other planet and looking at Earth, well, the, the light of Earth is going forth and shining and, and so on. And in a sense, in a, in a scientific, technical kind of sense, our life kind of casts forward, kind of unendingly. How can we make that stop? Because I tell you what, there's things that I've done I don't want to keep going into space. Well, I'll tell you what, psychology can't do it. Technology can't do it. Apple doesn't have an app for it. Only the omnipotent, eternal God who controls all the factors of time, space, and matter could ever effectively remove sin. Isaiah 43, 25, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake and I will not remember your sin. When God cancels sin, he wills it out of existence. It's forgiven and forgotten, it's annihilated. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So so what this means for you, Christian, is, is that what you do for God in this life is not done towards justification. You can't, like, man, I'm going to really get on fire for God, and then God's going, no, listen, you already got justification. You already aced the, the report card is A plus already. So you're saved. God's got you. And so because of his love and his greatness, because you are justified, your sins are washed away, you're clean, you're forgiven, you are delightful to your God. From there, do something. Do something for the kingdom. Serve. Give your life away. Let your energies be expended for the glory of your great king. Paul says, I gladly spend and am spent for you. There's a story that I heard about. There was a man in England who um, purchased a Rolls Royce and he decided to take it on holiday in Europe. Of course, England, you know, surrounded by water, so he had to have it ferried across. And he's driving around and, uh, and the Rolls Royce breaks down. Now, you pay six figures for a car, right? But it breaks down. And this, of course, was back in the days before cell phones and all that. So he, he had to cable the Rolls-Royce company and let them know. And they flew a mechanic out into Europe where he was. The mechanic fixed the car and took off. And the guy is thinking, man, I I know this is going to cost me an arm and a leg to get it fixed. And so 
Uh, but he, he didn't receive the bill, and he got back home, and he still didn't receive the bill. And, and so finally, he reached out to the company and said, man, I've just been waiting to, to receive the bill for the repair on my Rolls Royce. And they sent a letter to him, and they said, dear, dear sir, thank you so much for your letter. You need to know that we have no record in our files that any Rolls Royce has ever broken down at any place at any time for any reason. God has no record of your sin. None. So let that encourage you to live for your great king. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, what we, what we do with our life matters. There's, there's just no way around that. And definitely not wise for us to just try and be as comfortable as we possibly can as we await our glorification day. When over and over again in the scripture, we are just encouraged to be an adventurous people, people of faith, and people who care about the things that you care about. And so... So God, I pray for us that we would be so rooted and grounded in grace, so just immersed and convinced of grace that we could get a rebuke from you, <laughs> that we could get an exhortation and that it wouldn't turn into some kind of weird condemnation thing, but that it would just fire us up because we are your children saved by grace through faith. And you've called us to live a life of purpose and we don't wanna squander our days. So encourage us, Lord, fire us up, change us however you want, do whatever you will in us. Father, I can just sense that, that there are some in our midst that are just even feeling a call of God today. And so, Lord, just like in Isaiah 6, Isaiah overhearing you, who will we send? Who will go for us? There's people right now hearing your voice. They're, they're hearing the voice of God. If that's you this morning, would you just say, here am I, to the Lord, here am I, send me. Just whisper that to God right now. Lord, there's, there's some here this morning that have, have never trusted in Christ and maybe they've tried the religious route and just trying to be as moral as possible or, and thinking that that's, that's the way it, it works and, but it doesn't you don't justify people based upon their efforts justify them based upon their faith in Jesus Christ so Lord would you simply draw those among us who have trusted in something other than Jesus for their future for their salvation and bring them to the place where they come to know Christ as Savior and Lord so if that's you um that I'm praying about right here. You know it, you sense it, you feel it. Um, I'm gonna invite you to, to pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord. And that's, that's just an expression of faith. Praying is an expression of faith. In Romans 10, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. 
And so if you're ready to do that, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Do that right now. And then in a moment, we will pray. God bless you, buddy. Anybody else? Raise it up. Are you ready to trust in Jesus? Who justifies who? The ungodly. He justifies sinners. So you have to admit, you have to admit that that you're sinful like me. Anybody else? So for those of you who raise your hand, here, here's the prayer. You pray it. You mean it. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in you, that you died on the cross for me, that you rose from the dead. So please come into my heart and be my Lord, be my Savior. Yeah, let's welcome those who prayed.